Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and this is uh, kind of part two of the 1960s um, information. I'm going to divide these up into several different topics, as I mentioned in the, the one about the Kennedy's domestic policy. And so I won't cover the entire civil rights movement in the 1960s in this part, uh, but we'll cover um, uh, a good chunk of it because I want to talk about uh, how some of the other um, civil rights movement stuff leads to some parts of uh, the Great Society through LBJ. And so I'll cover uh, some of that in the Great Society recorded lecture as well. So as I mentioned from the 1950s culture stuff, talking about um, the civil rights movement of the 1950s, uh, Dr. King really got his start uh, as kind of this figurehead in the civil rights movement because of the Montgomery bus boycott with uh, Rosa, kind of sparked by Rosa Parks getting arrested and so forth. Um, Dr. King um, it was, was highly educated. You can look from his resume there of uh, where he obtained his degrees and so forth. And um, really, you know, started at the age of 26, kind of propelled himself uh, with the Montgomery bus boycott and so forth. And then um, really, I, I learned a story years later at a professional development training I went to that I think kind of stuck with me is helped me kind of helps understand uh, life experiences that shape somebody and so forth. But Dr. King and his wife on their wedding night uh, were refused a hotel room and the night of their wedding end up having to stay in the parlor of a funeral home. And so um, that ought to stick with you on your, your, you know, this excitement of your wedding day and so forth. And on your wedding night, having to stay in the uh, a parlor of a funeral home. And so, um, you know, once I learned that, I was like, well, that, you know, no doubt that shaped a lot of his life and legacy after that. Um, so really became one of the most powerful um, public speakers uh, in American history and certainly in the 20th century. In fact, his I Have a Dream speech is, is considered by many historians the most influential speech of the 20th century. And, and uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is considered uh, by some historians as the most influential speech of the uh, 1800s. And so here it is, they're dealing with much the same issues. Um, he does win the Nobel Peace Prize later in the 1960s, and unfortunately, uh, he is assassinated in Memphis in 1968, which we'll cover in a later lecture. Now, this picture right here, I, I uh, posted here, somebody wrote on that um, in anger when on the day he died. Of course, the, the eight's cut out from the uh, April 4th, 19, supposed to be 68 there. Um, and, to, you know, his, his death, now, this is actually a picture taken of him getting arrested uh, where he was arrested numerous times for nonviolent protests through civil disobedience. And so, as I mentioned, in the 1950s culture, part three, when we talk about the civil rights movement. Uh, Dr. King would often say that uh, uh, Jesus gave him his message and, and Gandhi gave him his method. And so um, one of the things that he is going to emphasize is you do these nonviolent protest um, and they get uh, the reaction and so forth is, uh, with the, the violence that, that emerges in the South, becomes on national television. It, a lot of Americans see this. They're like, these are just peaceful protesters getting attacked violently. And it uh, draws at them uh, in support of uh, the civil rights movement and so forth. So uh, this nonviolent uh, uh, protest was ends up being highly effective. Now, uh, of course, it, it doesn't have short term gains. It has more long term gains. And then we'll see later with the black power movement, which we'll cover in a different lecture. It's going to advocate more aggressive action and so forth and even even cases of violence. And as I mentioned uh, in, the, in the 1950s culture, part three lecture, Dr. King and uh, Reverend Ralph Abernathy co-founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So what it did is it organized African-American churches um, to kind of this grassroots movement. Um, to do these pro protests and these marches um, to achieve the end of segregation and equal rights in the South. Um, so anyway, it is uh, interesting that, uh, uh, you know, Dr. King be becomes his figurehead that had the Montgomery bus boycott been in somewhere other city, we may not know who Dr. King is today. So um, now there's some early civil rights legislation that, that happened. Of course, we know about Harry S. Truman uh, uh, issued an executive order that brought about the integration of the United States military, but Eisenhower also signed a couple other civil rights bills into place. Uh, the first one, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1957, created the United States Civil Rights Commission uh, and was supposed to investigate and report voter discrimination. It doesn't, it's not as effective as later bills in the 1960s. 
Um, it also gave the attorney general power to require federal courts to issue orders, um, you know, to prevent this voter discrimination and so forth. And then the Civil Rights Act of 1960 created these uh, voting referees to help correct these conditions. Now, all of this looks good on paper, but if it's not actually enforced, then it's not really doing anything. Uh, and so anyway, we'll, we'll look at uh, uh, sit-ins, uh, which we covered uh, in the 1950s culture part three part, uh, particularly the Greenville, South Carolina sit-in at Woolworth's lunch counter was, was the most famous. Uh, also boycotting, boycotting businesses that uh, had segregated facilities. Um, also the Freedom Rides, uh, and so, et cetera. Right now, I have you guys do your second film assignment on the Freedom Rides uh, and how that that's significant. Um, and it's organized by CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. And so this is uh, Kennedy. One of the things that led to Kennedy winning the election very closely against Nixon is that he um, favored African-American uh, rights and so forth. Uh, but he oftentimes did not want to anger Southern uh, white Democrat senators uh, and House representatives. And so he was kind of trying to fall, walk a tight line. And it's not until um, the March to Birmingham that sways Kennedy uh, to take more action, which leads to the, the March on Washington. Now, a very important Supreme Court case, uh, because you had uh, another Supreme Court case in 1957 that... Um, you know, integrated supposedly interstate buses. So bus companies that traveled across state lines uh, no longer could be segregated. Um, but Boynton versus Virginia um, made, it, made it where even waiting rooms and restaurants uh, that were connected to bus uh, stations could not be segregated either. Okay. And so what happens is CORE decides that they, in 1961, that they want to challenge the, these bus companies to see if in the South they indeed were abiding by the Supreme Court decision of Boynton versus Virginia. Okay, and so um, they set off from northern cities, uh, primarily D.C., but uh, also they they set off um, from St. Louis as well. Uh, but the the most famous one sets off from D.C. And so what CORE uh, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee did is they got young college students to give up some time during their summer, and both black and white students. Um, to just ride to see if they could sit side by side and not have white sit in the front and black sit in the back. And so what ends up happening is, as word gets out um, that these college students are doing this and the Ku Klux Klan organizes resistance to these movements. Now, the most infamous um, and well-known uh, resistance happens at um, in Alabama, at Anniston, Anniston, Alabama, where a kind of a white mob uh, awaits these students getting off the bus. And so they um, began hurling kind of like these like firebombs at the bus. And so they were going to suffocate them um, to get them off the bus to, to, to beat them. And what ends up happening is the people get off the bus. A lot of the I've seen some interviews done by those that, that, that survive or, you know, that survived this attack. And they thought they were going to get killed um, and they were pr proceeded to be beaten. And um, and so for a fact, there's a kind of an riveting emotional story where this young 12 or 13 year old white girl um, brings water to some of these uh, African-American college students who are being attacked. And, and uh, you know, and, and she was just, you know, terrified of what was actually happening and so forth. And so um, what happens is this gets on national television and it shocks um, Americans. And so the Kennedys get involved, particularly Robert Kennedy. Uh, and he demands that uh, um, that they're supposed to be across um, to be allowed to, you know, interstate commerce. And so um, anyway, it ends up leading to uh, the Kennedys filing lawsuits against these companies who did not comply. Now, um, some students continue on to the Freedom Rides. And uh, when they get to Mississippi, um, as you'll see from the documentary, they get ar arrested um, by the governor of Mississippi, um, and they get they get jailed for uh, you know a few time a few weeks or months or whatever until their their their, their time in, in jail was is ended and so forth and so they didn't, in Mississippi they didn't have violence there but they just arrested them peacefully um, to try to resist them that way and it actually just led to more freedom rides so it kind of just once this gets national television even more students end up doing this and even ministers also in that same year um, in fact there's a really good uh, ESPN 30 for 30 on this called the Gulfs of Ole Miss. And uh, I've seen it and it's, I think it's, I think it's a great um, 
kind of weave sports along with history uh, because it was actually this was the only undefeated Ole Miss football team. Um, and because of this, they actually were voted as number one team in the nation as a result of this. But James Meredith, who was actually an Air Force veteran, a highly intelligent guy, uh, had, had gone to Jackson State and uh, wanted to transfer to Ole Miss to finish out his degree with the GI Bill. Uh, the reason why he wanted to transfer to Ole Miss is Ole Miss was the premier academic institution in the state at the time. And so it knew it would open up more um, um, job opportunities. Plus, he wanted to challenge segregation. And so the NAACP sued the university that uh, because they said that his uh, application was denied based on racial grounds because he had very much was highly qualified to enter Ole Miss. And the Supreme Court ruled in his favor. And so he got to um, supposedly attend Ole Miss. Now, what ends up happening is Ross Barnett, who actually was not a very popular uh, governor at the time, uh, giving a speech at uh, the Ole Miss uh, football game, because they used to wave uh, the Confederate battle flag and so forth um, at games and so forth. They don't do that anymore. Um, to basically say he's not going to allow him to, to enter Ole Miss and whatnot. And so uh, the Kennedys are like, well, yes, you are. And so um, President Kennedy sent in these federal marshal to accompany Merritt to campus. Um, but what ends up happening is it's not necessarily Ole Miss students. There were some Ole Miss students who pr participated in um, the um, violence, but really it's these radical Klan members and others that, that come from surrounding areas to the Ole Miss campus and that erupts in violence. And so James Meredith was protected in the dormitory, but what ends up happening is 48 soldiers who are ordered to, to protect uh, and to restore order by uh, the President of the United States get injured. 30 marshals had gun wounds. They get shot at uh, and so forth. And uh, um, anyway, Ross Barnett gets gets uh, uh, fined. It's supposed to be sent to jail. He never actually served it. But what ends up happening is um, uh, even though two people are, are killed and, and more are injured, um, James Merrith actually does get to attend Ole Miss. Unfortunately, he was not allowed to go to a football game because they thought somebody would try to assassinate him there. Um, and he ends up graduating from Ole Miss. Now, this story does have a happy ending. Uh, James Meredith now, who's not allowed to go to a football game, now gets to go to box suites whenever he wants. There's a statue of him on the campus of Ole Miss. That was, it was really cool. The ESPN 30 for 30 shows this, and actually his um, son actually got a Ph.D. from Ole Miss. And uh, anyway, when the, old, the ESPN 30 for 30 documentary was made, um, Ole Miss elected their first um, – African-American uh, student body president. It's actually a really nice girl. They interviewed her and stuff for the documentary and, and how much Ole Miss has changed since uh, 1961. And so anyway, here's James Meredith today and he's still alive uh, as I'm making this video. And um, anyway, so he, that uh, the story does have a happy ending, but um, unfortunately there was a lot of um, um violence and, and unfortunately two ind individuals lost their life as a result of what happened here. Now, um, two years later, this is one of the most famous scenes of the civil rights movement, and that is the March on Birmingham. Birmingham uh, was considered by Dr. King as the most segregated city in the South. And uh, it's not necessarily that way today, but Anyway, it's, it's a large city in northern Alabama, a uh, big coal mining region or uh, a steel, steel town, a lot of steel mills there. And um, so one of the things that Dr. King organized the Southern Christian Leadership Conference is they got all these African-Americans and some white people as well to march uh, through um, downtown Birmingham. And they were going to try to shop at stores that were supposed to be for only for whites only. Now, the uh, Birmingham police chief, a guy named Bull Connor, um, who is this very... Um, uh, racist police chief, um, they deny that uh, the permit to have a parade. Uh, so you have to have a permit in order to have a parade in the city. It's, it's pretty much that way across any city in America because um, you can't just have any parade any day. Once you get you shut down streets and so forth, and so you have to apply for a permit. And yeah, anyway, because you have to have police presence to block off the roads. Well, he gets denied the permit, even though he, he does it legally. And uh, so they decide to march anyway. Well, Bar Bill Connor basically says, "Well, I got plenty of room in the jails for you." And so what ends up happening is um, the Birmingham Fire Department and Birmingham the Police Department uh, gets called in and these protesters, um, they spray them down with um, high pressure fire hoses. Now, when I played high school baseball, we would uh, water the, uh, the infield with one of those. And uh, one day, one of my 
and the teammates thought it'd be funny to shoot me in the back with it. Uh, and I can tell you right now, that hurts. Um, so you can imagine getting sprayed with that high pressure water hose, um, it can knock the skin off you, uh, and so forth. Um, and so all these, a lot of these, these, uh, protesters, these peaceful protesters get arrested. And, uh, while in jail, uh, Dr. King, who got arrested, writes his, uh, his famous letters from a Birmingham jail. And so in that, um, he, he basically still argues for nonviolent protests. And so his famous line in that is, it's one of the most quoted lines, um, from all of this. And really it's one of the most quoted lines, I think, of the civil rights movement period, um, where he talks about darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. He's arguing against violence. And really, when he, this letter, he actually penned to Southern white ministers to appeal to them uh, through Christianity to um, stand up for racial justice. And he says uh, racial injustice somewhere is going to be racial injustice everywhere. And um, so really, it was a motivating thing. And from the uh, March to Birmingham, which was widely televised on national television, a lot of Americans, particularly in different parts of the country, are like, wow, this is horrible. I mean, these are peaceful protests getting attacked by police dogs because they're being ordered to. Uh, they're getting sprayed with fire hoses and so forth. And all they were trying to do is just march peacefully and show um, that they could um, shop at, at whites only stores. And it leads to um, the famous March on Washington that happened in 1963. And so this is some information about uh, letters from a Birmingham jail. Um, anyway, it's, it's a really good, um, I would think it's one of the top three best civil rights pieces of literature to read. A lot of, a lot of famous quotes. And so um, next, what ends up happening is they organized this uh, March on Washington, and there was over a million people that were there. Uh, and it actually had a series of speeches uh, which Dr. King's speech um, was the keynote address. There's a bunch of different speakers who come. It was hot, it was August, uh, and so forth. Now, what's interesting, uh, because typically in my high school classes, I, I, we always we watch the whole speech. Um, so I want all my students to be able to see that they've seen. You can find it on, any, on YouTube. Just search I Have a Dream Speech, and you'll find plenty of postings of it. Um, and it's a really awesome speech. But the majority of the speech he wrote ahead of time, but it's the end, which is his most famous part. He ad-libbed. Uh, Dr. King came up with it on the spot um, and so forth. And where he talked about, I have a dream that one day my four little children will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And he keeps talking about having a dream of different things taking place in American society uh, for equality. Uh, what's crazy is uh, this is D.C. in August. You can see if you ever watch the video, all these people are fanning themselves. Dr. King's giving that speech in the middle uh, of August in D.C. with a suit on. That right, shows you he's tough alone and so forth. And um, anyway, there is a, a lot of famous uh, lines in the movie. Uh, but I think this part right here where he says, I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice um, and so forth. And, of course, uh, his, his uh, ending, uh, which is really riveting, where he says, black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Of course, the, of course, the crowd erupts in support and so forth. And we will get to more parts of the civil rights movement uh, in, in another part when we talk about um, the um, civil rights legislation done by LBJ. Because really, um, what, what this is, the March to Birmingham leads to, to the uh, March on Washington. And that leads to what I think the biggest civil rights legislation of the 1960s is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which in segregation and public accommodations. Um, so you see the March to Birmingham leads to the March on Washington which leads to the Civil Rights Act of 64. And later we'll see that the march to Montgomery um, and the or violence that erupts from there is going to lead to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which ends the literacy test and, and so forth. Um, and then also the 24th Amendment that gets rid of the poll taxes. So now it's free to vote anywhere in the country.